Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Al-Fatiha A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Allahumma ghafir lana dhunubana wal ikhwanina allazina sabaquna bil iman wa lan taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lil ladina amanu innaka raufur rahim Allahumma aslih lana dinana alladhi huwa ismatu umurina wa aslih lana dunyana allati fiha ma'ashuna wa aslih lana akhiratana allati fiha ma'atuna waj'al alhayat ziyadatan lana fi kulli khayr وَاجْعَلِ الْمَوْتَ رَاحَةً لَنَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَرْ Ya Allah, bless this event. Fulfill our wish and objective that this event accomplish al-falah, success for us both on wool and hereafter. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adaban nar wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Taqabar Allah minna wa minkum Hello Malaysia When did we speak last? Let's talk about Malaysia Where do we stand? Malaysians want a new Malaysia That upholds the principles of fairness good governance, integrity, and the rule of law. What are the issues we bring to you today? The vision of new Malaysia. Malaysia in 2030. Legacies in transition. The governance and sustainability of shared prosperity. Governance Gone Wrong Corporate Governance Let's Walk the Talk Are you ready? A round of applause ladies and gentlemen Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and a very good morning. Yang berbahagia Datuk Wan Suraya Wan Muhammad Razi, Secretary General of the Ministry of Entrepreneur Development. Your Excellencies, High Commissioner and Ambassadors. Yang berbahagia Datuk Nuripah Kamso, Chairman of Bank Rakyat. Esteemed speakers, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural Bank Rakyat Integrity Forum 2020. Institutionalization of reforms in the new Malaysia. Malaysia is on a journey to reform and institutionalize these reforms. Post GE14, as Malaysia transitioned into a new era of good, good governance and political will to reform, the government, through the National Anti Corruption Plan, NACP, which it launched in January 2019 last year, committed to building strong corporate governance for government-linked businesses, statutory bodies, and the private sector. Today, Bangra yet initiated the Integrity Forum 
to engage the highest levels of people involved in institutionalization and regulation of reforms. As the sustainable bank, this is Bank Rakyat's commitment to imbuing serious and lasting governance culture within the bank and its people and contribute to the vision of Malaysia to be known for her integrity and not corruption. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, against the backdrop of diminishing trust in government-linked businesses, one of the core strategies in the NACP is to inculcate good governance in corporate entities. To discuss these changes and the wider landscape of institutional reforms in GLCs and GLICs, this session now is themed Setting the Stage Malaysia in 2030, Vision, Governance, Ethics and Sustainability Model of Government-Linked Businesses. Can we invite our esteemed panelists, Tunku Ali Zakri Alias, CEO of EPF, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Shahril Reza Rizwan, Managing Director of Hazanah National Berhad, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram, Member of Economic Action Council, and Dr. Hasnita Hashim, Chairman of Majlis Amanah Rakyat Mara. To moderate this esteemed panel, we have Ms. Fairoz Abdul Hamid, Advisor for Bank Rakyat. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Political interference, is that real? or are, are corporate leaders just unable to manage politicians and legislators and executive? Government in business, or bis how much government in business and how much not, and what's the best model? Should government wholly own business, partially own business, or should we move towards ca the truly capitalist market where there is no wealth tax, and billionaire philanthropists decide what goes on in our markets. Are our regulators up to mark? Are they, who's auditing our regulators? Are our onboarding courses even relevant today? Are they offering the right soft skills to our leaders? And finally, is this whole agenda of reform and institutionalization a pipe dream? Will it change when leadership changes? These are some of the things that we will speak about this morning. And I am Fires Abdul Hamid. I'll be with you for the next 50 minutes. But before we start, please watch this 30 second video. What to expect? Can I just start, um, thank you very much to our panelists, and my first question, if I can right, just get into it, is what caused the erosion in governance in Malaysia, if you can each, and what are the main challenges going forward vis-a-vis -vis GLCs and GLICs? Each one of you can just take it. That up. Shariel, you want to start? Yeah, I think um, uh, before we um, talk about the idea of, of an erosion in governance, I think uh, first of all, I think the, you need to be clear as to where we actually make great strides. Um, and in the early 2000s, I think, you know, under Kazana, we had this concept basically of the GLC Transformation and Reform Program, uh, which actually did a lot to improve the governance framework in a lot of companies in Malaysia. Now, I personally have always had uh, some misgivings about um, how we did that, um, primarily because I think during those days, um, we felt it was necessary to widen the net considerably um, in defining really what's a GLIC or what's a GLC. And you can understand at that point in time basically why we did that. Now, it was done basically because we wanted to kickstart a program and get traction um, across as many companies as possible. Uh, but what then happened basically I think is that you know, it kind of left the market with a very long-term impression that a lot of companies are GLCs when really they shouldn't be. Um, so it's something which I think today when we think about the market and how government you know, operates in the market and how governments actually own or control businesses. Um, we have to be very clear now, I think, to define what really is a GLC and what isn't. Um, so in my mind, I think, you know, when you think about where government has a role to play, um, 
it should really have a role to play in regulating markets in terms of providing the kind of regulatory framework for businesses to operate in. Uh, but certainly, and this is really, I think, the practical example you've seen from countries all over the world, governments do a very bad job of actually running businesses. Um, and we should really separate the two, the role of government as regulator and as a framework provider, and the role of businesses in governing themselves, and uh, especially when they're listed in market, uh, doing it in the context of basically a proper governance framework. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and just give my other panelists a bit of a Professor. focus. Yeah. Very briefly, I, I think uh, one might distinguish between uh, two types of governance issues. I think one is the erosion of confidence in government. And this, I think, can be attributed to a variety of factors, but particularly the greater influence uh, of uh, business interests in influencing government policy. This has become very, very serious uh, as, uh, in the last uh, half century, if I may say so, and um, uh, the problem continues to, to worsen. And this is not, not seen as illegitimate. It's seen as, as perfectly normal. Uh, and uh, that's one set of problems. The second set of problems, I think, is the fact that as a consequence of the tremendous influence of uh, business interests in, uh, in shaping the rules of governance, uh, including private governance. So we all have all these buzzwords about corporate, improving corporate governance and so on. But what does it actually mean? Improving corporate governance may well mean, for, ex for instance, uh, that you have a greater uh, short-termism, uh, focusing on you know, your quarterly report, reporting uh, and so on and so forth, uh, rather than a long-term vision, which is absolutely necessary if you want to build a nation. If, for example, the Republic of Korea had been governed by such short-termism, I don't think it would have ever gotten anywhere close to what it is today. So I think we need to begin to think about how the rules of what is ostensibly good governance have themselves been captured and uh, much of the regulatory creep, which is often referred to, uh, has in, se in a sense served particular uh, business interests and so on. So today, for example, uh, you find that there is discussion, uh, a lot of debate going on in the United States about how uh, the role of finance has been involved, uh, finance has been largely involved in what is called value extraction rather than value creation. So the, the challenge then becomes one of how do we reform the, uh, the, the, the environment or the ecology, as some would have it, uh, to ensure that finance better serves uh, the, the, the interest and the development of the real economy. Let me stop here. Thank you. Dr. Hasnita? Um, I, I'm going to limit that discussion, I mean, my opinion on uh, statutory bodies rather than a whole uh, government because uh, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, in terms of erosion of governance, I think one issue is the rapid expansion of uh, stat statutory bodies into areas where they're not familiar with, for example, going into uh, businesses. And they're not set up to uh, govern this. Um, and they, the, the head office, uh, the main uh, institution, uh, lose uh, oversight and control of uh, subsidiaries. Uh, I think having a good understanding of uh, how can you oversee uh, when you expand and have so many centers and subsidiaries and, and so on is critical, and that did not happen. Um, for example, when once you set up a subsidiary, you have your boards, they are free to do whatever they do. So you have to go and look into uh, internal controls and processes. Uh, you have to look into the memorandum and articles, or what, you know, what are shareholder reserve matters, for example. This uh, has not been done. And so I think that uh, caused uh, erosion. And then when you look at the corporate sector, uh, Companies Act has been revised and revised to m make sure there's proper governance. But when you look at statutory bodies, um, you know, uh, this uh, act that has been set up has not been revised for 50, 60 years. Um, uh, there has to be a legal weight given to uh, committees set up under the boards, for example, you know, nomination, uh, audit, uh, risk. Uh, that has to have uh, to carry legal weight in the acts itself. So that's from my point of view. Ali Zakri? Oh, there, there isn't a mic here. Uh, can we have a fourth mic, please? No problem. We'll, we'll yeah. share. 
in the spirit of sharing. <laughs> uh, it's becoming a normal adage for me now in every forum that I appear in Malaysia that I have to make my first statement is that EPF is not a GLC and neither is it a GLIC. Actually, this is a rather artificial concept created by the organization run by Datuk Sharil. So I'm, I hope he ap appreciates the challenges that I'm running under now at this point of time. Uh, because if you actually look into the definition of what a GLC is, believe it or not, Bank Negara is also defined as a GLC. Um, so I hope we can actually start uh, either redoing our definition of what a GLC is or a GLIC with a very clear definition of what the roles they're supposed to play and also the correct identification because one of the main challenges I'm facing at this point of time is not really doing my job but it's actually managing the perception of my major stakeholder which is my members because my members at this point of time they think that the, what we are doing is for to follow the whims and fancies of the government. I mean, we do follow the direction and the, the, uh, in the, well, that's too strong a word. I think the advice from the government in terms of the direction that the country is going, but at the end of the day, whatever EPF does, it's for the benefit and to protect the interests of our members. So that one, I have to go and set it down in, in, in play. Now that in itself actually comes into my second point when you talk about government and governance, I think, uh, is the role of perception. Now, when I was a lawyer, one of the major things uh, that was uh, when we were trained as a lawyer is that justice must not only be done, but it must also be seen to be done. And I think at this point of time, irrespective of the governance uh, structures that we always talk about, I think the main question that we need to go and answer down there on the ground, are they actually perceiving that the governance processes uh, that the government purportedly or uh, ostensibly actually puts in place, is it actually being done? I think that in itself is something that all of us can judge because we can see what's been happening in the media. Uh, a lot of things are being trialed by media or uh, a lot of things are actually being brought out to the areas which should not actually be, be, be done. Uh, and I think this is one area that we really need to, to, to look at. So uh, if I can just uh, wrap some of the points that each one of you said, JLC is formed but moved too fast. Maybe we might have missed the fundamentals of governance. Jom, Prof. Jomo saying, what exactly is governance? Let's really look at this. Is this, are we creating private sector lobbyists in the name of governance and, and promoting that? Uh, that Dr. Hasnita on uh, the whole concept of statutory bodies and is it even relevant today? Is anyone even re reviewing the regulation under which it was formed and yourself, even if you are not, the whole definition of GLC and that, that being the case, really the perception management. But so, if I can, if I can just break each one of down, each one of those one by one, um, the entire perception of government in business. Let's let's go into that perception, or is it reality, or is it just perception? The whole notion of pol political interference in this notion of statutory bodies in business and GLCs, because the highest highest form of corruption as is uh, identified in the national anti-corruption plan is from political interference so the question i have really is is it truly political interference or our leaders or chairmen and ceos completely are completely unable do not have the skill sets to manage executives and legislative bodies so can, can you do you want to take that? Yeah. Um, I'll, and it's I'll, like, sorry, and it's so easy to conveniently gen blame the politicians. So really, it's... it's yeah, so I'll, I'll take um, uh, one step at that. I think going back to the theme which you know, I spoke about and which uh, Lisa Chris spoke about as well, I think, and that's part of the reason why at Kazana, we now think of it slightly differently. Um, so at Kazana, as you know, we now operate on the, on the assumption that we actually operate two distinct funds, uh, one of which basically is a commercial investment fund where effectively what we invest in basically are purely for commercial investment reasons, right? Um, and we don't see those companies anymore today as GLCs. Um, we believe basically that those companies should be free to compete in the market, um, and they compete uh, basically on the basis of their own governance and their own frameworks. And these would be companies like Exiata or CIMB, um, you know, IHH and all the rest, where um, conceivably as well from a matter, as a matter of philosophy, you would argue basically that there's no real reason for government other than as an investor in those businesses through Kazana, um, having an interest really in the operations of those companies. They are really non-strategic to, uh, to the country. 
Um, conversely, we have a strategic fund uh, where basically we put in our strategic investments. Uh, those are investments or companies where by the structure of those companies, government either has a golden share or they are monopolistic in nature. And therefore, there's a reason why government may want to have a closer look at how they, they run. So, so the fact that like, government uh, has... Airports and um, you look at basically things like Tanaga and Telecom and all the rest, right? Um, and I think that's a very clear decision that you need to make because otherwise, you know, if you want to define everything as a GLC, then it's going to be very hard for those businesses to operate because they keep thinking of themselves as having to keep referring back to the government. Whereas really they should just operate um, under the regulations that they um, uh, uh, work under and just compete with all the other businesses that they are competing against. And I think that's one of the things which I think, you know, this government is now thinking very um, clearly about now, uh, which is really about to what extent does government want to have a say in how businesses are run, right? So quite clearly, we have a golden share and you have the right to appoint a CEO, like in TM or Malaysia Airports or Tanaga, and then government has a bit more say in the governance of those companies, right? But other than that, really, they should just leave it to regulation. Uh, and I think that's something that we've been pushing for, moving to an environment whereby government doesn't overly interfere in businesses anymore, but just effectively manages through regulation and through uh, the legislation process. I just want to go and follow on from the point of Dr. Sharil because uh, let's make it very clear. The government has a very important role to play in business. It is not a binary system where the government is not a business. But the, the real key question then, what is that role of, of, of the government? Uh, I think this is where there's a lot of blurred lines. When the government actually starts to, uh, might be mistakenly thought to become business, as opposed to what Dr. Shari had actually mentioned. The responsibility of the government is to go and set the right direction for the economy of the country to go and move forward, to set the right infrastructure in place for the players within the economy of that country to go and achieve that, 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 that objective and to also ensure, you know, it's sort of like rap on the knuckle if people start to go and, and, and veer from it. But the role of the government is not to be in the business. That is my personal uh, 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 viewpoint at this point of time and the uh, government then will need to go and ensure that it's the right people with the right competencies with the right skills and the right fit for the job in order to go and carry out that vision however I think the question that you might need to go and ask is at this point of time if we were running it like a business right do we actually have a very clear vision plan at this point of time of exactly what we want to go and achieve by 2030 I think that is one of the main roles of the government at this point of time so that we in the business side can actually start playing our role in order for us to can make it happen Scott, do you want to take uh, I, I'm afraid I have to dissent from my pan fellow panelists I, I think we have a situation where there is no ideal of uh, what should be the correct formula in terms of the balance between the public sector and the private sector there is no uh, a formula for, for what should be the case uh, as far as uh, the appropriate role. There, there are so many variations and I think uh, uh, Ali Zakri made a very important point earlier in saying that we conflate too much by calling everything GLCs or clicks. But at the same time, I think even the old uh, nomenclature, the old language uh, of calling everything public enterprises and then differ differentiating between statutory bodies and uh, government-owned companies and so on and so forth uh, is not terribly helpful. Ownership is one very important dimension, but as uh, Dr. Sharil emphasized, we have uh, many different criteria for what should be considered strategic and so on and so forth. And I think nobody in the world today believes that uh, uh, everything left to the market is actually uh, going to be the best interest. Uh, if we look at, uh, at the growth rate of, say, the, the country south of, of the causeway, or we look at other countries where the, the ro government, role of government has been quite significant, I think we would we, it'd be, we'd be very hard-pressed to suggest that private enterprise has necessarily been superior. However, I think there's always the huge problem that the role of government can be easily abused. Uh, but you, not only through uh, inappropriate regulation or one-size-fits-all type of regulation, uh, but it also in many other ways, as, as we in this country know very well. So the challenge, therefore, is how do we ensure that uh, that, that that balance? You know that that you have uh, government exercising leadership and providing, uh, 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 in a sense. Um, uh, directing investments in ways which are most appropriate. For example, today in this, in this, uh, in an economy, in a world economy where there are doldrums, 
I think we, if, if without leadership, you know, just leaving it to, uh, you know, uh, let's, reduce, let's tax these people less in the hope that they will invest more of their taxes, uh, uh, sorry, their, their, their saved uh, uh, income uh, into uh, new investments. The, nobody believes that anymore. And the, the literature is very, very uh, con confident about that. What is more difficult is for those who believe in uh, government providing some leadership to demonstrate that they can do it well without being abused and so on. So I think we have a very, very important challenge and we need to change the nature of the debate, especially in this country, because we tend to be overly influenced by Anglo-American models of governance as well as corporate governance. And I think we know that both the Anglo-American models, both, the, both sides of the North Atlantic are both in very serious trouble. And, and also, very importantly, size matters. A big economy like the US is very different from a, a small economy. Like, so if you have uh, scale economies, for example, in an industry, it may be inappropriate to have too many uh, firms. Uh, so insisting on a particular formula for the level of concentration on the size of a corporation uh, can actually be detrimental and inhibit um, uh, Malaysian companies, for example, from becoming internationally competitive. So uh, I guess uh, my natural follow-on question from just the points that are being made is, is this conversation being had at the government? Who's, I mean, you're, like yourself, Prof, you sit in the EAC yourself as well, Dr. Hasnita, and, and Dr. Sharil has access to the Prime Minister literally through his board and, you know, as well as uh, Ali Zakri to MOF. Are we, who's advising who? I mean, on the one hand, government, is appointing CEOs or, uh, and chairman and board under whose guidance? Because you're saying that they may not know business, yet they are appointing these people on boards and chairmen and so here. Who's advising them? Is there a clear process to that? And if there is a model to be changed, who is advising who? I mean, where is this debate and conversation that we keep talking about that we need to have is being had? We have a lot of task forces and and plans and who at which level is advising who so i think that would be very useful for us to know for people like who are not in the in the high places yeah so um in an ideal world right if you look at the corporate scene and now i can talk about that a bit more rather than the statutory agency scene right but in a corporate scene, basically, every company has a board of directors, right? And there's a very clear legal principle, which is essentially that the board of directors basically has a fiduciary responsibility to the company, right? Um, and by that, what it means actually is actually to the company and the stakeholders, not necessarily the shareholders of the company only. Uh, because every company basically has a whole bunch of stakeholders. As soon as you take money from a bank or from a lender, right, that is one of your stakeholders you have to take care of. So when it comes to appointments of CEOs and management and all that, it should really be left to the boards of those companies because ultimately that is their responsibility. But are uh, they being left to the boards of the companies? Um, uh, is there still political interference of uh, someone darting in some, th some people? And, because that's the perception, like Ali Zakri says, uh, we need perceptions, uh, perception, reality lags perception. So is it true that uh, someone in some places are appointing people that people have to just live with or are uh, n nomination and remun remuneration committees in organizations truly effective and independent of government in government owned businesses yeah so i think if you look at if you look at our stable companies for instance right there are clearly some companies where like it or not because of the structure of the company of a golden share right, you don't have a choice right so um, Malaysia Airports or TM or Tanaga, for instance, right? The board can do its process of searching for a candidate. Um, it can effectively, because of the golden share, you need the approval of the Minister of Finance or the government to actually appoint a CEO. It can recommend a candidate to the government, right? But because of the power of the golden share, the government can actually make up its own mind and decide, I'll appoint someone else, right? Now, is that the right thing to do? I would argue basically that from a commercial and from a you know, business point of view, it's probably the wrong thing to do, right? Um, uh, can you, I, I wouldn't imagine basically that someone in government would have a better idea about what it takes to run a company like that rather than his own board of directors, right? Um, but legally, right, they are entitled to do so and that is actually a legal thing for them to do. They can actually impose, and we've seen this in the past, right, um, impose their own choice of candidate. Um, I would imagine, and you know, looking at past history or some of these companies, um, it 
on nine times out of ten, right, um, the CEO candidate imposed by government tends to be, for one of you know several reasons, um, the wrong choice, right? Um, and things then basically escalate, and you then have to do other things uh, to 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 recover from that. So that's one thing which I've been trying to argue with the government, which is basically that we should move away from having a golden share in a lot of these businesses. The golden share concept basically I think came about because in the past when regulation wasn't really effective enough and wasn't really a very good professional regulatory framework, the golden share was a way of government controlling how these companies operate. But today I think if you look at the energy industry or telecommunications or aviation, you know, you have you know, really good regulators now um, in energy, the MCMC, in telcos, uh, we used to have MEFCOM um, in uh, airports, right? Um, and you can actually regulate how these businesses run through regulation rather than through a golden share. So I've been arguing for a while now, basically, that actually government should just get rid of the golden share. So, and they're not listening to you, obviously. I think it's hard <laughs> for I think it's hard for people to give up something that they already have, right? Um, and it's obviously very hard, especially you know in the corridors of power, right? Um, when you feel that you've always had this right to appoint and control companies in this manner. Um, to actually step back and think of it logically and say, actually, I don't need it anymore. And I can actually regulate through the regulators and through the legislation. So, yeah, I think this sort of instruments will need to be evolving with the times. Because when, uh, you know, things like the golden chair and all that, those were the days when people were quite um, non-vocal. You know, they didn't have much access to go and voice uh, their displeasure, if at all. But these are very different times nowadays. You know, everybody with a handphone has a voice. So I think the government, if uh, from managing a perception perspective that the governance is actually being carried out, uh, that the choice of candidates is being done in the right and true proper manner, uh, I think the government will actually have to really look in terms of the processes of this appointment of key personnel. Gone are the days when you sort of like just say, I pick this person and you know, tough, tough luck to everybody else because it's, it's my final say. Uh, taking into account Gen Y, Gen Z nowadays, they want to be part of the decision making. So I think if the government doesn't manage this, doesn't handle this, and doesn't manage the perception of governance, I think they will do so at their own peril. Uh, the, Prof. Jomo, Dr. Hasnita, you sit in the AAC, EAC Economic Action Committee. Do you not discuss these things and advise the Prime Minister of them? I mean, naturally, you are. Um, you, you, you would know the market uh, uh, and, and the government would, would look to you to, to, for advice. So are these debates being held in these forums? Uh, uh, it's not, uh, I think this particular subject has not yet been discussed at EAC, but we've had various conversations on this issue. Uh, I agree with Aliza Kri. I think we should respect processes. You know, if there is a clear process, uh, for example, you have a nomination committee and so on, government f are free to nominate candidates. You know, we, we don't have to say no just because they are being nominated by the government. Uh, we can have a number of candidates, but it has to go through the right process, the interview process, to make sure there is a proper fit for the job at hand. And then there is, uh, you know, I like, like in the financial services where it has another body, for example, a central bank uh, to assess uh, fit and proper. So I think this kind of processes uh, should be put in place um, in all uh, institutions. Uh, and that's healthy rather than parachuting somebody in and expecting people to uh, accept this person. I think that should not be the practice anymore going forward. Yes, I think um, uh, what Dr. Sharil said earlier is, is actually very important, that we need to work with the existing set of regulations. We need to be serious about uh, trying to um, enforce them and, and, and so on. I think the, uh, the, uh, my vision uh, would involve also reforming many of these regulations uh, and, and particularly highlighting what would be considered to be in the national interest in a very serious sense, yeah? not, not simply as a, as a pretext for doing uh, all and sundry. Um, and that, I think, is much more difficult. So the, what Dr. Hasnita has just mentioned is a, actually a very, very difficult conversation to have. You can't have it over the course of uh, uh, one, two, or three hours and expect, you know, the, 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 uh, there are over a thousand uh, GLCs 
Um, and uh, the, 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 the nature of these GLCs, as we have been reminded, is so varied. It's not a question simply of their legal status, but also what they're involved in, their status within the respective industries, both nationally as well as internationally. So a one-size-fits-all approach, as some people purport to offer, is a very dangerous solution because you, you obviously will not be sensitive to the, to the various nuances uh, involved. So I think we have to deal with the fact that in, in, in modern corporate culture, uh, we often find that, that uh, that uh, shareholders, especially in a relatively small uh, economy like Malaysia, shareholders have an inordinate amount of influence. And I'm referring particularly to, the, to private interests. Uh, generally speaking, the role of government tends to be benign, although you have, of course, uh, uh, you know, s uh, some uh, uh, senior executives who have uh, taken advantage of their positions and so on, and all this is coming out in the courts and elsewhere. But by and large, the, the role of government is benign. But just having a benign gov role of, for government that is not enough. We have to set higher standards for ourselves. How do we ensure that we have uh, what, for want of a better term, might be developmental governance? And, and these, are, these are not easy questions. So I, I don't think uh, a discussion, a one-hour discussion in the EAC is going to resolve anything. I think what we need is a rich public discussion, which will then perhaps culminate uh, in, in something which might occur in the EAC. But that prior discussion at the level of the public, because we make, we hear all kinds of generalizations about GLCs and so on and so forth, which are actually very unfair to the GLCs because the GLCs are so variegated. Maybe, um, I think it's worth uh, noting that, um, that the strategic thrust number six of uh, NACP covers corporate governance is one of the things that GIACC is uh, pushing for in the reforms of boards and statutory bodies. Perhaps, uh, I guess, the follow-up question that I have from Pro Prof. Jomo's um, comment is, is it timely to now have a regulatory reform for all stat bodies to relook at the original intent of what they were set up for? Uh, because most of them have uh, evolved into, uh, evolved beyond the original vision of what they were set up for. Should the government lead in such a regulatory reform? Because some of these reforms will include uh, uh, acts in parliament that needs to be changed. Comment, uh, Prof. Hasnita. Yeah, definitely it's timely to look at uh, reform. I mean, that will be a real institutional reform when you actually look at the reformation, especially governing uh, statutory bodies. But that has to be led by government because there has to be political will. Uh, this has to go to parliament and uh, requires a stakeholder to buy into it. What we can do on our part as boards or councils is uh, to make suggestions in terms of changes. Uh, in my case, for example, we're looking at uh, to strengthen um, you know, oversight and governance is to give statutory uh, weight to all the uh, committees uh, under the council or boards, because at the moment, for example, in um, the Mara Act, there is no statutory weight. There's no mention of, for example, uh, audit committee or nomination committee. So there is no statutory weight given to that. Uh, the so, other one so is. So who, who oversights your institution? Well, uh, like many statutory bodies, we have a minister having uh, an oversight of the organization which is something that the government may want to look at in terms of having check and balance and what is the right structure for each statutory body. Um, you know, having one person to make all the decisions is also unfair to that person uh, having that full weight of responsibility. So that is one area that you need to look at. Uh, second is the giving statutory weight to committees. The third one is looking at um, uh, different circulars that comes out of different ministries. And uh, where do they you know, uh, play a role uh, when you compare that to the act that governs the state bodies? Because there's a lot of confusion. Um, you know, we'll get circulars from Ministry of Finance, but we report to KPLB and we have the Mara Act. And sometimes people will just use things that's convenient to them. There's a, a, a real so are these circulars the legally binding? Sorry? Are these circulars that yeah. are being issued by ministries legally binding? That's a question. How legal 
Uh, they're circulars. Yes, Are they? they? That's <laughs> You must have had a lot of circulars, I'm sure. No, oh, we're, we're a company, so we <laughs> operate as a company. Okay, if, if we can just, because uh, uh, time shows I've only got 12 minutes left, um, very quickly change gears to uh, role of regulators. Uh, of late, uh, we've had cases that are being heard. Uh, some of the criticisms have been on the relevance of oversight bodies, structures, and regulation in this country. Uh, so who, sh who audits the auditors? Are our regulatory system relevant anymore for the corporate governance of needs of the times? Are they agile enough to change our regulators? Uh, are they engaging market or are they just also set in their ways? Um, and uh, really, uh, should, do we need more regulation or less regulation or self-regulation? I mean, really, if you can just have a discussion on that before I go into my final question, and then if we have time, we'll open questions to the floor. Prof? Again, I have great difficulty responding to this question because we are talking about a wide variety of companies. And to have a single formula, a single answer about how much regulation is needed for all of them is, is, is hugely problematic. Obviously, there needs to be a greater, greater improvements in, in corporate governance and, and so on and so forth. But for example, if you're trying to set, say, executive remuneration for such for over a thousand different companies, ranging from you know a few, uh, companies which are barely uh, uh, worth a million to companies which are worth several billion, you know it, it, that that boggles the mind. You know, you how do you set uh, standards for for this variety? And there are no simple answers. So I think we shouldn't try to, to regulate where it is almost impossible to regulate meaningfully. But we, what we do need is a greater degree of, of, of accountability. And uh, I think what Accountability have, from? Accountability achieved partly through transpar transparency. And uh, one of the big problems with GLCs is the fact that it became very convenient for, for, for governments in the past to, um, to borrow and uh, to, to have uh, government guaranteed uh, debt uh, which, which never went to parliament. So there was absolutely no accountability for government guaranteed debt. Only government debt was, was accountable to parliament. So we had very, very little transparency, very little opportunity for MPs, let alone the public at large, to, be, to, to follow, to understand what was going on, to try to track what was going on, and to, 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 uh, to, to, to talk about it. Um, you know, we, we, uh, Dr. Sharon mentioned the question of, of some of the regulation, like regulatory bodies being quite effective. I would also emphasize that the other side, you know, whether it's a glass half empty or half full, and we have seen how MEFCOM has been closed down. And the public perception of the closing down of MEFCOM is not terribly good. You know? So I think we have to, this is a very, very difficult question. And I think what we do need is far greater transparency in order to ensure greater accountability, in order to improve governance. But I think one size fits all solutions are hugely problematic. Zachary, you want to comment? Yeah, well, uh, I think regulators are needed, provided they play the right role and they have the right competency. Because if you're going to go and have a game without an umpire in place, you're going to go and have a massive mess at the, at the end of the day. So, but then it then boils down to basically number one, the regulators need to understand the role that they play. They are there to umpire, they are there to go and ensure that the game is clean or as clean as possible. And the objective of the game is actually uh, achieved, but not get involved in the game directly. And the second requirement is also those regulators better know what the game is all about. Do they know? Well, uh, I, I think I can't make a sweeping statement, but in maybe one or two of my experiences for EPF, uh, we've had some challenges in dealing with one or two regulators who didn't understand the business of what EPF is. And because EPF, we handle so many different types of assets and so many different types of investments, uh, it's a hugely complex uh, organization and, and business business that we run. So if you just want to go and have a regulator who's just there uh, to tell us what to do without really understanding why we are doing it and how we're going to actually do it, then you're actually going to create a bigger mess. 
Uh, anyone else? Prof. Hasnita, Dr. Sharia, you want to comment on regulation? I know you, you're a great believer in self-regulation, no, or not? Not, not self-regulation. I, I think, I think you, it's very hard to have a speaking statement because I think you need the right type of regulation and you know, whether it's heavy or light regulation really depends on the industry and the objectives you're trying to achieve. Right? So I think in markets where, or in businesses where basically there's already a lot of competition in the market, I think what your regulator needs to achieve basically is to ensure there's a level playing field. Um, and you know, we already have basically a, for want a better word, a monopolist type or anti-competition type commission. Right? Um, and that's something useful to have because you also want to make sure that across all industries, businesses don't try to accumulate too much market power uh, through uh, effectively unfair means. Right? Uh, and that's actually quite important to have. Uh, most developed economies really focus on, I think, that aspect uh, to level the playing field for, for people. But in specific industries, for instance, right, um, and you know, airports and airlines, for instance, right, um, I think the industries as a whole are looking at uh, the proposed disbandment of MAFCOM and trying to figure out what that actually means for the industry. As you merge MAFCOM with CAM, right, um, what does it mean for the industry and how is it going to actually develop further uh, from this point? And that part is still relatively um, unclear, um, and I think the industries are waiting for direction on that. Um, in telco, for instance, MCMC has been doing a good job in, in certain parts, and I think certainly I think you know, the, the new direction that they're taking in terms of encouraging telcos to work together on capital rollout, for instance, I think is a right decision to make. Um, so, you know, quite clearly the ability of a regulator depends a lot on the skill sets and the people in there. So you need to make sure you have the right people with the right skill sets. And more importantly, I think, you know, being very transparent and clear about what the policy objectives are. You can agree or disagree with those policy objectives, but I think as long as you're transparent about it and you apply those rules fairly, at least businesses know how to operate. Right. You may disagree with ultimately some of the policy objectives, but that ultimately is a purview of the regulator and the government. Okay, at this point, I think we'll have uh, only time for one or two questions. Would anyone have questions? And the mic will come to you, I think, because I don't have much time uh, and I've been told to wrap up. Um, anyone for any questions? Or I'll continue with mine. Just put your hand up. Wow. No? Are all the queries answered? Uh, okay, can can the microphone go to a gentleman there? Thank you, thank you so much. Just introduce yourself and, and a brief question, you, please. Mic, please. Microphone, please. Uh, morning, my name is Rohaimi. Uh, retiree, pretty much. Now, uh, interesting, I want to follow up a uh, matter about what Prof. Jomo has said. Uh, in terms of there's no one fit model or a blanket thing about which way to go as to how much business or government involvement in business. But again, uh, of late, you may have read about what, what comments about Singapore. Singapore has only one government and yet it's working effectively, which means I think they are pretty much involved in a lot of business activities. Now, number two, you compare US against China, China is pretty much state control, and they are doing hell, sorry for the word, doing very, very well. And of course, on the other extreme, America, you look at Mr. Trump, well, they are doing well also, but um, matters on moral uh, something questionable. So uh, I quite agree, but I think in the case of Malaysia, when you go after a particular crisis, for example, corruption and abuse, So the question is, sir? The question because, is, I yeah. think for Malaysia, we have to pl really play a hard ball on, on, on pertaining uh, matters pertaining so to a, business a, and governance and governance. So I think there's no two way about it. Uh, once we have solved that problem a bit, or the you know it, it's lightened up, then we can release a bit of the control. Thank you. So there was no question. So but it's okay. Um, I've been told to wrap up because the prime minister is on his way. So can, my last question to you. Uh, I'm, I'm before that. I do apologize. I can't open the question for more questions. Last question, wrap up question is, this whole agenda of reform and institutionalization, is it really a pipe dream for countries? They talk about these big words, but really it will change when a leader changes. Is it for, it doesn't necessarily have to be for a country, it can be for an organization um, that is pushing for change, but tomorrow a next chairman comes and then that plan then collapses. So the whole cons your your view of what institutionalization of reforms mean? If you can wrap, if we can just wrap up on that note. 
Yeah, so I, I think issue of reformation basically is very important. And I think you know we've taken great steps um, across a lot of institutions. So, um, but quite clearly as well, there have been failures, um, and it all boils down to people, right? It was all boils down ultimately to who you put in charge, either as chairman or CEO, because they drive basically the agenda. So in organisations that have done very well um, through basically all these political changes and have been quite steadfast in their governance, um, you'll see basically it's actually led by the people who are there. So I think that the, 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 the key thing really is choosing the right people to lead these organizations and institutions. Prof. Jomo? Yes, I, I do think that it is important for, for the current government to take the, its um, manifesto much more seriously. Um, all, un, admittedly, there were many problems in the drafting of the manifesto, and those should be uh, made, well, made known, made public. Uh, but at the same time, I think there is a tremendous need to, to, to pursue that. Um, the, when the eminent persons uh, committee um, had uh, existed, it had a subcommittee which created a, a series of uh, institutional reforms. I have my own views on many of those proposals, but I think there should be a public discussion of those kinds of reforms. I think what we very badly need uh, is public, greater public discussion about the nature of the reforms, the pros and cons, and so on and so forth. I think what we have had from all the panelists is a very nuanced discussion about the difficulties of reform. And I think we need to have much more open discussion of those reforms and, and, and very specific types of reforms rather than one-size-fits-all type of reforms. Dr. Asnita, 30 seconds and 30 seconds. The bell has rung. Okay. Well, first of all, I think the government is committed to institutional reforms. From what they have done in terms of uh, putting people in place and, and so on, there is commitment there. There is a lot of work to be done. We have to be steadfast and resolute, and we have to give it back to the government what needs to be done and engage with all stakeholders. That's my take on it. Aliza Kri? There You're... must be mutual respect between the government as well as the uh, players. Uh, in terms of the government respecting the reasons why the organisations were set up, the mandate that we are supposed to go and fulfil, yeah. and help us to go and, and, and make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, when I started this uh, panel, all four of them said to me, tomorrow they might not have a job, uh, with the questions that I was going to pose, and with, we, we really need to put our hands together and commend them for being candid. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen.